this is John Evans, and welcome back to another episode of Book and Spade. Today's episode is dedicated to three pivotal saints, saints who I consider to be mentors in the faith, brothers and sisters of the Word of God. Today I am sitting in Sacred Heart Monastery among first, second, and third class relics of these holy men and women. The first saint I'd like to address is St. Augustine of Hippo, the doctor of grace. Now, last semester, I had the privilege of taking a semester class analyzing his tome, The City of God, and his famous confessions. And for me, he was a saint who I was able to personally relate to as someone who wrestled with his quest for varitas, or truth. It was around the year 410 that the Roman world seemingly fell apart. The Visigoths, led by Alaric, stormed through the streets of Rome, wreaking havoc, burning, pillaging. And this empire, which had lasted for over a thousand years in a single day, seemingly lost its continuity. It was not as though forms of administration had collapsed, the Roman legions were still abroad. Roman currency was still technically in play. And of course, we were dealing with a civilization that had out settlements uh, throughout the whole known world as far as Palestine in the east and Britain in the west. But it was very clear that the world that Augustine had grown up in in the 350s had come to an end. Refugees traveled to where Augustine was bishop and they wondered to themselves, why had this imperial city, the city which seemed synonymous with civilization itself, how could God, how could God allow this culture to fall apart? Well, I would like to compare this moment to the events of September 11th, 2001, when of course after the, the horrors of that day, Many wondered to themselves, where was God when the World Trade Centers fell? And where was God ultimately when the American identity and psyche seemed to be tarnished after the, the terrible wars that followed um, and other calamities, both politically and personally within many Americans' homes? Now, the trouble of Augustine's day was explaining the critiques uh, of pagans who blamed Christianity, ultimately, for the disasters which had befallen the world. Around the year 312, uh, Constantine the Great converted to the faith, and in doing so, was able to usher in a new Christian Roman era. Beforehand, to be a Christian meant to be hunted by one's own government, to be rounded up like cattle and slaughtered if one didn't uh, pay homage to the emperor. But now we were living in a period in which it was culturally acceptable to be a son or child of God. Nevertheless, there was a great discourse between Greek and Roman philosophy, and of course, the, the scriptural worldview. And Augustine found himself placed in this context. Now, as a young boy, Augustine grew up in North Africa, now, when we think of North Africa today, we often marvel to ourselves that at any point in history, it was what you would call the Bible belt of the ancient world. And yet it was. Christianity here was not simply a matter of cultural belief and not simply what you did on Sunday. It was rooted into the very minds and hearts of her local people. This was very true for Augustine's mother, whose name will run down through history as the name of one of the greatest helicopter moms uh, ever recorded, Monica. And Monica instilled in her young son um, a desire to discover the truth first and foremost, but also to, to engage in prayer. Um, Augustine's father, uh, whose name is often rendered as Patricius, uh, was, however, more of a lukewarm pagan. This is not to say that he was interested in any of the ritualistic practices, um, but for him, his life mission seemed to be more dedicated on matters of the world, 
Yet he instilled in his son a desire to try to be a persuasive speaker, uh, a master of rhetoric or of oratory. Now, in the modern world, we have very few examples of study which could be compared with rhetoric. Um, the art of saying something well in the ancient world was seen as paramount because it was the way you could uh, engage the, the polis or the city. And in persuading those of the city-state, you could become a man of great power of learning. This went back to the pagan world, uh, particularly with Romans such as Cicero and the Hotensius, or even as far back as Socrates in the ancient Athenian world. But it, it still entered into this, this Christian culture. So Augustine lived at a time where he did grow up in a mixed home. Uh, it was a home that wasn't necessarily um, only a matter of learning Bible verses. He was engaging with a time of great diversity also. Well, during his adolescence, when he was going to the equivalent of what we would call a CCD class as a, as a young catechumen, he realized that he was less interested in theology and more interested, of course, in the women in his class. And he already was far more focused on trying to excel personally with uh, academia, with research, and with study. This came to a head when, at the age of 17, due to financial reasons, he was forced to go home uh, to Tagaste. Um, and what's interesting about this return, because he was born in Tagaste, not in Carthage, um, is he is confessing in his writings to what appears to us to be a petty theft. The, the petty theft was that of um, a pear tree that was situated in a neighbor's garden. Now, he was with his friends. He had no desire for pears. He had no desire to engage in an act of stealing. Yet nevertheless, uh, it's very clear to uh, commentators that Augustine internalized this act of robbing his neighbor as being synonymous with an instance of original sin. Now, the doctrine of original sin, the idea that all of us are wounded uh, because of what occurred in Eden at the beginning and foundations of the earth, is a concept which has always been with the early Christian world. But the language which we use to define it or understand it was still in play. Augustine's description of how he stole for the sake seemingly of stealing, uh, for the sheer pleasure of the act, seems to establish a language or a kind of vocabulary for this uh, internal struggle with a desire to do what we know to be wrong. And yet there seems to be this kind of cosmic or mystical pull, which previously hadn't existed in this particular form. This event uh, ultimately shifted Augustine's focus firmly away from uh, a Christian ethos. But he still was interested in pouring through the scriptures and pouring through a Christian worldview. Well, at the age of 17, another pivotal moment actually occurs. In this moment, he is reading up on Cicero's Hotensius. This document essentially emphasized a desire to discover uh, varitas, or wisdom. It basically states that we are all philosophers. Either all of us say to ourselves, we are going to dedicate our life to this one ethic, or we come up with an excuse, rationally, to ignore the call to discover truth. Either way, according to Cicero, we are a philosopher. Well, Augustine saw this, and he said, I want to basically go through a career change. He had been on a path to become a successful lawyer. Now he wanted basically to um, focus his life to philosophy. So looking for wisdom, he went to the one place that many of us go to, and that was to the Old and New Testaments. But Augustine had been um, introduced to more of a fundamentalist reading of scripture growing up. So when he opened up the Old Testament and he read about all these patriarchs and their concubines, and some of the other unsavory elements. Uh, it wasn't the high poetry that he was used to reading in Ovid and in Virgil and in Homer. Instead, here he was introduced to a worldview um, that of course was a lot more earthy and, and it basically led him to dismiss the scriptures and the Christian worldview for him as being um, too 
much of a matter for children and less of a matter of, of higher learning. Now, of course, later on, as all of us know, he would grow out of this uh, understanding of Scripture. But for the time being, he put aside a traditional, what you would call orthodox, Nicene view of the church. So in response to Augustine's uh, unsatisfactory reading of Scripture, inspired by a more literalistic or fundamentalist reading of the text, um, Augustine turns to a cult to discover the innermost secrets of wisdom and of truth. Now, this cult happened to be uh, dedicated uh, around the philosophies and principles of Mani. It's often called Manichaeanism. Now, Manichaeanism is a harsh form of materialistic dualism, where the world is divided as on a chessboard between the white pieces and the black pieces. Evil and good are seen as evenly matched. And according to this very harsh philosophy, it is the materialistic body that is the source of all evil and all that is perverse in the world. Therefore, the philosophy was a means which Augustine was using to rationalize his attempts to uh, consort with prostitutes uh, and others of a less savory character. Augustine is completely open about his experiences um, living what you would call a raucous libertine lifestyle around this period of his life. But all of this changes when Augustine finds what we read in the Confessions uh, as a concubine, who he never names, this, this woman who he falls deeply and madly in love with. Now, we should be careful about the term concubine, which we read in his Confessions, because that conjures up terms in our present culture of a sex slave or some kind of um, a lower, um, someone in a subordinate uh, place who's being uh, abused and, and misused. According to the Roman world, you could be in a common law marriage for an indefinite period of time, and there would be no sharing of the assets. And it would be a common law marriage without legal bonds, but which could produce children and obviously be seen as uh, fairly tolerated within that culture, in, in that worldview. So Augustine falls in love with this woman, and he produces with her a son who he names Adeodatus. Now, we can see in the name of Augustine's son something of his tortured mind. Because Odeo, sorry, Odeodatus, as a name, means a gift from God, or my present from God, the one whom God gave to me it leans more towards a Christocentric worldview, at least a more traditionally monotheistic one, one which was entirely opposed to the philosophy of Manny. So Augustine adrifts away from this perspective. Now, Monica chases down Augustine to Carthage. Um, as I have admitted earlier, I misspoke when I said he was born in Carthage. He was actually born in Tagaste, uh, but he traveled to Carthage for his studies. And there, uh, Augustine uh, came across a man of great learning named Symmachus, who told him that there was a post for a great rhetorician uh, at the court of Milan, where the current uh, reigning king and queen were over the Roman Empire. Uh, now, Augustine, as a result, decides to take this position. But he does something in this passage of the Confessions, which a lot of people still find despicable. Uh, he basically allows his mother to sleep in or stay uh, overnight at a local shrine. And Augustine leaves his own mother uh, on the shores of Carthage in secret to take up his post in Europe. Ultimately, what ends up taking place, of course, is uh, Monica realizes what has been done. And she just jumps on the next boat and hunts down her son. But it was Augustine's uh, callousness and actually being willing to sacrifice those around him for this very uh, sharp ideal of truth, which, of course, he would later uh, begin to mourn and, of course, uh, begin to lament. Now, when Augustine finally reaches uh, the city of Rome, where he teaches for a while, and then ultimately Milan, he's already beginning to drift away, as we've said, from this harsh dualistic Eastern cult. He's more thinking along the lines of there has to be a single God who is synonymous with the idea of truth. It's in Milan and in Rome that he begins to meet uh, Neoplatonic thinkers. Now, 
The Platonic worldview, of course, is much more op optimistic. Yes, the ultimate goal uh, of life is to escape the cave, the world of illusion, this, this veil of tears, but there are some tangible um, comparisons we can make between the Neoplatonic worldview and, of course, uh, many church fathers who, while critiquing it, found it to be very helpful. Uh, this worldview emphasized the fact that there had to be uh, a supernatural order to the universe. Uh, it also emphasized the fact that these forms or ideas could be uh, understood uh, by means of rational discourse or discussion or dialectic. Augustine makes this comparison. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later on, we read that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, obviously, the statement about the Word becoming flesh, the incarnation, God becoming man, was yet un... Well, it was something which Augustine definitely did not accept yet. But Augustine was able to accept the previous statement, that there was a word or, or logos beyond this physical reality, which needed to be explored by means of reason. So he's already on the road to faith and reason. Well, eventually, Monica catches up with him in Milan. And through Monica, and through his professional work, he learns about a bishop whose name is Ambrose. Now, Ambrose is one of these very fascinating guys who begins to interpret the Old Testament, uh, not as uh, literally as some other commentators. In this sense, what's fascinating about uh, Ambrose's approach is he says that some passages of the Old Testament seem to refer to the, the greater supernatural realities, uh, the, the angelic and the diabolic hosts, for example. And in doing so, we're able to then better understand um, statements in the New Testament, which, of course, we can read from a much more uh, compact, uh, much more uh, orthodox lens. So Ambrose allows Augustine to interpret uh, passages in the Old Testament from a, a much more uh, orthodox worldview. And as a result, Augustine is able to use his Neoplatonic philosophy now as a stepping stone towards a Nicene or Catholic understanding of the Christian worldview. So seeing this great pastor, this great priest, a man who truly loved his, his flock, a man who truly loved his congregation, Augustine was able to encounter um, something of the risen Christ. But Augustine was dealt a serious blow around this time, which threw him back a notch. Uh, Monica wanted him to marry uh, a woman of equal social standing. And Augustine's uh, common law wife, of course, wouldn't do because it's deduced by many scholars that she was not of that class. And therefore, Monica insisted that this woman who Augustine had basically treated as a wife for years be dismissed and sent away. So uh, a woman with whom Augustine basically had gone through all walks of life with in his 30s is essentially sent to the docks and we hear from her no more. She's never named in the confessions. We don't know about her parentage or lineage or what she did for the rest of her life. But there is a pious tradition that eventually she formed a convent uh, someplace in North Africa and that she would love only Augustine for the rest of her life. Well, Augustine um, quickly took another uh, concubine, but one who was not necessarily on the same emotional or romantic status. And he was in a state of deep spiritual darkness. He knew that he had fallen short of the kingdom of God. He knew now that he was morally responsible for his actions, that the world isn't divided evenly between good and evil, that there is only one God, and that Satan, of course, is only a creature, and yet still has the great power to tempt us. And of course, as we read in scripture, is the ruler of this world, meaning he has the ability, of course, to draw us into vice, and yet still through our own free will, through our own free will we fall. And therefore Augustine, by meditating upon his own free will and realizing how far he'd stumbled, he thought, how could I, the, the wretch among all wretches, someone who basically is the playboy of the ancient world, how can I possibly reach the level of sanctity 
which my mother Monica is insisting upon and which my, my friend Ambrose is suggesting I, f I end up following. Well, Augustine goes through this experience when he's in a garden. And we read in the Confessions that he's alone in this garden, reminiscent of the Garden of Eden and the Garden of Gethsemane in Scripture. And he's weeping and tears are pouring down his face. And he's racked with grief and with anxiety. And he hears over a neighbor's wall a voice crying, uh, Tolo lege, tolo lege, pick it up and read it. Pick it up and read it. Now, Augustine freely confesses he doesn't know if this voice that he's hearing is the voice of a guardian angel, if it's the voice of a child uh, over this neighbor's wall playing a, a game, uh, whether it's the voice of the Father or of the Son of the Holy Spirit. But he does take it as a sign directed to him by God. And he runs home where he just so happens to have a copy of the epistles of St. Paul open. He reads a passage about putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that blinding flash, in that one moment, he feels the persuasive force of grace, gratia, compelling him so that he can eventually be uh, brought nearer to Christ and in relationship to Christ. He sees the mercy and the forgiveness and the pardon of the Son upon the cross. And in doing so, by accepting Christ as his Savior, by embracing Christ in that one moment, he feels he has reached a point of absolution, a point of release from all the weight of sin that had bogged him down before. His life as, for lack of a better term, a cultist. Uh, his life as a rambling philosopher. And, of course, his life with his essentially now estranged and um, an old wife. Well, after this, Augustine and his friends read about the Desert Fathers, particularly the life of St. Anthony of the Desert. And they decide to form a religious community, if possible, in North Africa. Ambrose baptizes Augustine while he is in Italy. And Monica, who had spent her entire life praying for her son, praying for his conversion, praying that he would come back home because she had spent many hours and sleepless nights hoping that her son would come to an understanding of the truth. She is exultant because finally she has seen her son become the man she had always longed for him to be. Well, Unfortunately, while Augustine is on his way back home to North Africa, while he is on his way back home to Italy, what's unique about this experience is Monica grows very, very ill. And she stops in a town called Ostia. And in Ostia, Augustine and her share a private moment where their minds, according to the confessions of Augustine, seemingly ascend to God the Father. And they're able to see truth, goodness, and beauty in all of God's creation. They share a moment of great love and great hope. And shortly afterwards, I'd say within a week or so, Monica dies. Augustine now has lost his mother and basically his, his wife. Shortly after his return to Africa, he loses his son, Adeodatus. He is now left with his friends, his brother monks, and entirely left with God. And yet, instead of becoming despondent, Augustine takes on this call, and he becomes not only an ordained priest, he also eventually becomes Bishop of Hippo. Now, we can see in Augustine's life, up until this point, an emphasis on free will, the idea that, yes, we can choose between the good and the evil. And yet the fact that there is this mystical force called original sin that, let's say, skews or wounds our ability to rightly discern for ourselves between these two paths. And that is why we are in need of God's grace to come in and assist us. We cannot do it on our own. We cannot save ourselves. We are in need of, of course, the truth to save us. But as Augustine learned, as we have studied from his childhood, 
to his life as a bishop was that the truth is not an idea or an abstraction. The truth is not the unmoved mover of Aristotle. He's a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. Now, what's unique about Augustine's next passage of life is Augustine, while he was in Africa, was dealing with many who had broken away from the Catholic Church, the universal church founded by Christ himself upon the rock of Peter. There was a sect of Christians called Donatists. These Donatists had separated themselves from the body of Christ under the um, belief, under the conceit, that all the rest of the church had become corrupt, that the rest of the church had become too decadent or too worldly, and only they were the purest, wisest forms of Christians, and only their baptisms, and only their confessions, and only their um, offering of the Eucharist was valid. Well, Augustine obviously took issue to this group, and he was an integral part about bringing them home. Now, in my own journey, and I think we know in all of our lives, there is a temptation often to wonder if the whole world has become too corrupt, if the institutional church seemingly has fallen short of the promise of the kingdom. Uh, with the revelations as of this summer in 2018, with the McCarrick scandal, and with issues associated with um, abuses of minors and abuses of seminarians, there are many now wondering whether it is uh, viable, whether we can safely say that the church is indeed the mystical body of Christ. But Augustine was always quick to say, particularly in his later writings in the City of God, that the church is not a museum for saints. It's a hospital for sinners. And as a hospital for sinners, we are all being called closer to conversion and closer towards a relationship with Christ. We're all staggering. The Donatists were ultimately brought into the church because their sect turned violent and their overly conservative approach, almost militantly conservative approach, became self-destructive and they passed away like a vaporous smoke. Well, Augustine also had to deal with another heresy, which I think is relevant for our present time, currently with the scandals and issues associated with the church. Augustine dealt with a monk from Britain named Pelagius. And Pelagius was uh, a monk. We we're pretty sure he was only a lay person. Um, but he was a spiritual for, a director for many in Rome who believed we are saved by our own bootstraps. We, we don't need God to send his grace down to assist us in our discernment between good and evil. Pelagius felt that we're saved by our own works. We do it because according to Pelagius, he thought this business about original sin is rather depressing. It's rather unnecessary. It's rather dark. Um, Pelagius doesn't seem to have been uh, necessarily tempted all that much. He seems to have been someone who felt like he had the ability to rightly choose between good and evil, essentially, because God gave him a roadmap in the exemplar of Christ to do so. But of course, works righteousness is not how we get to heaven. Augustine knew in his own life that he had fallen so many times. He had fallen short. Now, we don't have many Pelagians, I think, within the Christian world today that I've met. Maybe many others have, and if that's the case, um, you have my deepest condolences. Um, but we see Pelagians, in, I think, in the secular world today. Those, particularly on the far left, who like to claim that I am not fallen, I have no need of a savior, I can choose between what is right and what is wrong because I have my own exemplar be that Christ or some other man. And yet, of course, we know that Pelagius is wrong. And the early church knew that Pelagius was wrong. And Augustine was able to ultimately refute Pelagius, and as was the Pope, because we see that that philosophy leads to a do-it-yourself religion. The word religion comes from the word for relationship, the relationship between us and God. That relationship is not one of 
treating God like a cosmic slot machine, asking whatever we want from him and expecting whatever worldly result, nor is it the Pelagian worldview of saying, God, I can become perfect just like you by my own power. It requires us repeating the prayer of the desert fathers. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And because Augustine knew he needed mercy, and because the early church knew that they needed mercy, ultimately the philosophy of Pelagius faded. And of course, Augustine's emphasis on grace and our need for grace would take up uh, many, many notebooks of philosophy and of faith and bleed into conflict during the 16th century, during the, uh, the Reformation. So we can see in Augustine's life, a bishop, a philosopher, dare I say a bit of a rambling poet, who we can relate to in our current time of struggle. At a time when many are asking themselves, why should I stay in the Catholic Church, considering all of these abuses and vices, and you know, the list goes on and on. We can say that the time of Augustine, this time of a great saint, was no less filled with corruption and vice and controversy with those on the far right and those on the far left of the theological spectrum. And yet, Augustine said that we are all called to a relationship to Christ because our hearts are restless, he said, until they rest in you, O Lord. And why are... why? Are our hearts restless until they rest in God? We need to ask ourselves, what are we made for? Augustine saw that the civilization of Rome was falling apart. He knew that the monastery and the medieval world were going to come next, or at least he seemed to have some premonition of that. And therefore, he clearly demonstrated to his contemporaries that we are not citizens of an earthly kingdom, but we are citizens of a heavenly one. And as a result, we need to realize that when the world comes beating on our door with great concerns and with fear, we have confidence that this veil of tears is not our only home. At the same time, nor is this an excuse for us to neglect the needs and concerns and the heresies that plague the church from time to time. Augustine did not sit in the sand nor did he retreat into his own private world when the church was threatened from within because of the Donatists and also from within when it came to the Pelagians. He deliberately attempted to debate the representatives from these heretical sects by engaging them in rational argument. Now, what is fascinating is we have many of the reported debates uh, recorded by stenographers and in his own personal writings, um, in which he would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Donatists, uh, particularly about their own heretical beliefs. And we have reminiscences about the Pelagians and other writings. What's interesting is Augustine always treated his opponents with respect and humility. He saw them as people and as children of God first, and as lost sheep who needed to be brought home as you would a loving brother or a loving sister. His arguments were rarely ad hominem, and he always tried to appeal to their reason and, and their desire for the truth. This is because Augustine realized how far he had fallen. Now, obviously, our own current scandals and crises are rather different in regards to uh, the level of abuse and the nature of the abuse that has occurred. At the same time, we also have the crises of those who have left the faith due to these current scandals. And of course, because of misreadings of scripture and poor catechesis. Many who I went to CCD with as a child, many who I studied the faith with as an adolescent have gone their own way because they felt that the needs of their soul were not being met by the sacraments or by the church. This is a great tragedy. And it's a tragedy, I think, that can be answered if we ourselves go out into the world as little apostles, dare I say, as little Augustines, attempting to explain the faith lovingly and tenderly 
and to answer the tough questions, wielding both faith and reason as our allies. This is because we know that our faith is not only rooted in rules or dogmas, but that these very dogmas reflect supernatural realities that can be rationally uh, deduced or that can be explained through revelation. Yet, at the end of the day, we ourselves must arise to the challenges of our own era. At the same time, there are plenty of other saints who we can turn to as exemplars of conversion and of confession. Next time, we will begin to explore the worlds of St. Therese of the Child Jesus and of St. Faustina as exemplars of the faith who we can learn from during these difficult and these trying times. Thank you, and may God bless you all. Thank you.